If NASA were concerned about distinguished traces of projectiles being found in the fake moon rocks, why wouldn't they just use projectiles made from the same metallic elements found in the samples, such as aluminium, which, as a matter of fact, is exactly what NASA does today to simulate micrometeoroid impacts on the International Space Station. Aluminum pellets? First off, actual micrometeoroids bear no mineralogical or chemical similarity to the aluminum alloy pellets used during today's micrometeoroid simulations. Like their big brothers, the meteorites, micrometeoroids are made of rock, mostly iron and a few oxides. ESA mainly farms out this type of testing today for the International Space Station. They're testing the long-term reliability of the exterior of the spacecraft and the effect on spacecraft functionality by shooting the hull with aluminum alloy pellets. And although there is aluminum in some moon rocks, it's in the form of aluminum oxide and fine metallic grains. You definitely wouldn't expect to find aluminum clumped around all the zap pits. And the aluminum pellets used to do micrometeoroid impact studies on Earth would be made of an aluminum alloy and they would leave an obvious trace of metallics at the surface during impact and down through the tiny boreholes. It might be suspicious to a lab tech who cross-sections one of NASA's moon rocks and by performing a basic spectrographic analysis identifies a common aluminum alloy on the inside of a moon rock, an alloy that is knowingly manufactured on Earth. That wouldn't fool a geologist's grandmother. That's true, but I never said they used aluminium pellets to make the zap pits. My actual statement was... If NASA were concerned about distinguished traces of projectiles being found in the fake moon rocks, why wouldn't they just use projectiles made from the same metallic elements found in the samples? Notice the words, same metallic elements, as in, more than one. Here, Webb is putting words in my mouth. He knows the aluminium pellets I referred to were for testing the ISS, not for creating moon rocks. Nasty habit there, Phil. So again, to clarify, zapits can be formed using pellets made from aluminium oxide, or iron oxide, or whatever substance that needs to be discovered by geologists to make the zap pits convincing. Actually, come to think of it, if you're trying to duplicate the effects of micrometeorites, why not just use the real thing? Now for quite some time, I considered this to be impossible, as, to my knowledge, all micrometeoroids burn up in the Earth's atmosphere during meteor showers, and as such, never reach the surface. But, it recently came to my attention that this is not true at all. Reading through papers presented at the 8th Lunar Science Conference, I learned that particles larger than 200 micrometeors undergo partial melting and ablation during atmospheric entry, while their smaller brothers, only a few micrometers in diameter, do not encounter as much friction and subsequently do not reach their melting points, meaning that they can reach the ground intact. Fortunately, micron-sized interplanetary particles can enter the Earth's atmosphere without destruction, and they can be collected in large numbers for laboratory analysis. Techniques for routine recovery of these particles from the stratosphere have recently been developed, and interplanetary dust can now be considered a new source of extraterrestrial material for laboratory study. These routine recoveries of such material involve mounting a 20 square centimeter oil-coated plate onto the high-altitude U-2 plane, and ramming the said plate through the air at 20 kilometers altitude. This allowed it to collect particles no smaller than 3 micrometers. Now, these U-2 experiments were devised after the Apollo program had ended, but as you will see later, other successful micrometeoroid recovery experiments were executed long before Apollo 11. These papers led me to the brainchild of the micrometeoroids theory, Fred L. Whipple of the Harvard College University. His theory was discussed at great and lengthy detail in two proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one in 1950, the other in 1951. And the foundation for his theory is a story in its own right. In 1946, during the Great Jacobinid Meteor Shower, H.E. Landsberg collected several small magnetic particles that apparently were associated with the shower. Some of these particles, a few microns in length, were extremely angular in shape, wedge-shaped and opaque. 
it seemed unlikely that they could have been the end products of vaporizing meteors. Landsberg concluded that they must have been stopped by the atmosphere without being heated above their melting points. As a result of his suggestion, I have developed the present theory to investigate the process whereby temperature radiation can dissipate the energy gained by encounters with atmospheric molecules sufficiently rapidly to permit finite meteoric particles to be stopped without melting. Some basic concepts of this theory have been discussed by Ernst Opik, and an application made in the case of an isothermal atmosphere. The term micrometeorite appears to be an appropriate designation for one of these small particles. Whipple's theory was summarized verbatim in an abstract printed in Volume 57 of Popular Astronomy. In this 1949 paper, Whipple urged people to sample these micrometeorites for the advancement of science. The writer heartily encourages the collection and study of micrometeorites, as they may provide the only laboratory samples of cometary material. Ordinary meteorites arise probably from a different source, deep oceanic sediments, as suggested by the Challenger expedition, polar snows, and even geological strata also may contain evidence of astronomical phenomena. This statement reappeared in the 1951 Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Furthermore, there is the possibility that micrometeorites and deep oceanic sediments, as suggested by the Challenger expedition, in glacial snows or even geological formations, such as chalk beds, may provide a record of past astronomical activities. The writer earnestly hopes that this paper may encourage the collection and study of micrometeorites. Current work on this problem is being conducted by D.K. Norris and F.S. Hogg, while J.D. Budhue has recently summarized his and others' observation data on meteoritic dust in general. It seems that Whipple was correct, as it turns out that micrometeorites have been found in, surprise surprise, the polar regions. Micrometeorites, as they are known upon arrival at the Earth's surface, can only be collected in areas where there is no terrestrial sedimentation, typically polar regions. Ice is collected and then melted and filtered, so the micrometeorites can be extracted under a microscope. I could not find anything on micrometeorites in the Meteoritical Society search engine, but according to micrometeorites and the mysteries of our origins, micrometeorites were found in Greenland in 1984 and in Antarctica in 1987. While this is clearly long after the Apollo program had ended, it doesn't change the fact that such discoveries were predicted nearly 40 years prior, and so these discoveries were no real surprises. This hammers another nail into the coffin of those who claim that no one expected to find meteorites in Antarctica until after 1969, and amazingly, it offers up yet another reason to go to Antarctica to look for meteorite specimens. But even if NASA didn't retrieve any micrometeorites from Antarctica prior to Apollo, it seems they had devised a method of catching these particles during atmospheric entry. On page 489 of the Encyclopedia of Sciences, we learn... The first micrometeorites were collected in the stratosphere in 1970 using a balloon. Since 1974, they have been more efficiently collected by U-2, ER-2, and WB-57, NASA stratospheric aircraft. This tells me that, at least for Apollos 14 to 17, NASA definitely had the means of collecting real micrometeorites. But who's to say that similar sample retrievals could not have been done for Apollos 11 and 12? After all, NASA had been flying these high-altitude planes and balloons long before the Apollo missions. Hell, rookie astronaut Roger Chaffee had been flying the U-2 during the Cuba Missile Crisis long before he became NASA's prime candidate to be the second man on the moon. Actually, it seems that the first micrometeorite sampling occurred long before 1970. Information of these balloon experiments is surprisingly scarce, but my search led me to the Dudley Observatory's webpage on micrometeorites, which carries this little history lesson indicating that NASA was out to sample these micrometeorites right from the word go. During the period of Curtis L. Hemingway's directorship, the main work of the Dudley Observatory shifted from observational astronomy to space science. Research centered around the study of cosmic dust in the upper atmosphere and in space. The analysis of micrometeorites to determine their origin formed the bulk of the research performed over the next decades. 
Micrometeorites are tiny particles less than one ten thousandth of a meter in diameter that bombard the Earth from space. Efforts included collecting micrometeorites with apparatus flown on high-altitude aircraft, balloons, and spacecraft, and analyzing the collected materials using such tools as electron microscopes. Dudley's first major contract was awarded in 1959 by the Air Force Cambridge Research Center. In the early part of 1961, a NASA grant supported balloon-borne sampling devices in the Sesame Project. Sounding rockets were used for the same purpose in the Pandora program. Volume 70 of the Astronomical Journal carried an article which confirmed that these Project Sesame balloons had collected micrometeorites between 1963 and 1964. A balloon-top micrometeorite collector has been used to sample particles from the Geminid, Zeta Perseid and Aritad, and the Perseid meteor showers. The flux values for particles larger than 5 microns in diameter collected during the shower periods, and also at times in absence of showers, are shown in Table 1. Reading through the Astronomical Journal and the Journal of the Smithsonian Contributions to Astrophysics, I learned of another micrometeorite sample return mission, the Venus Flytrap Project, which used recoverable sounding rockets to successfully retrieve micrometeorites from the stratosphere and bring them safely to Earth as early as June 1961. Collection of micrometeorite particles at sufficient altitude to rule out terrestrial contamination has been achieved! The Venus Flytrap Collector was fired from White Sands, New Mexico on June 6, 1961, at 5.31 a.m. local time. Specially prepared particle impactors were exposed for four minutes between altitudes of 88 and 168 kilometers and successfully recovered. The experimental surfaces exposed consisted of 0.24 square meters of 6 micron thick mylar foil for impact and cratering studies and 0.13 square meters sealed boxes which were loaded with high purity materials and surfaces suitable for electron microscopy. Three independent electron microscopes and observer teams have been used to evaluate, count, electron micrograph, and measure the micrometeorite particles collected on the boxed samples. Most of the particles collected were sub-micron in size, and approximately seven particles per square millimeter were collected. So in summary, the scientific community had known micrometeorites were landing on Earth since 1949. Plus, they had a good idea where to look for them and sample them, and methods of sampling them were devised as early as 1961. So all NASA would need do is sample these tiny rocks, load them into their particle accelerators and, pardon the pun, turn their fake moon samples into Swiss cheese. Actually, it seems there is also a way to fake the zap pits without even using the gas gun. NASA could just as easily have carried their fake moon samples aboard the high-altitude balloons or sounding rockets and exposed them to actual micrometeorite bombardment in the stratosphere. Both methods could just as easily have been done. The only advantage the gas gun has is that there is no risk of losing the fake moon samples should the balloon or sounding rocket get lost. Now, while this alone doesn't prove that the moon rocks are faked, it does offer a plausible explanation as to how NASA could have gone about faking these impacts. And as seeing as Webb has confirmed that suitable guns did exist in the 1960s, and that NASA had all the data they needed to know how to simulate such impacts, not to mention the fact that NASA was already experimenting in meteorite impact simulation studies long before Lunar Orbiter experienced the real deal, I'd say, problem solved, wouldn't you?